uh, as long as we don't get booed off for uh, doing some Python coding in, a, in an Erlang conference, uh, I think we're going to be OK. Uh, so let me, let me get started. Let's first start talking about Disco, which is the, uh, the foundation on which we built uh, our little framework called Inferno. Uh, Disco is a really great project, started in Nokia. In fact, some of the guys uh, who created it and are working on it are here and probably doing a talk later today, so I encourage you to really uh, get into that. But uh, uh, Disco, you know, it, it's in Erlang. Uh, the foundations are in Erlang, and the uh, sort of the runtime is in uh, Python, or really you can write it in any language you like, but the default package that ships with it is in Python. Um, it's, uh, there's no Java, so, you know. Uh, so why didn't we pick Disco to do our big, uh, big data work with? And I'll talk about what we do in just a second. But uh, really, there was one main reason. <laughs> no XML. I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you guys have set up Hadoop or uh, sort of similar projects. But you really have to you know, uh, dig through hours of XML modifications before the thing is up and running. And we wanted, uh, we wanted something different. We were, you know, when we started with Disco, we were a small startup. We just wanted to uh, get something done. Um, so it gives you the simplicity of Erlang clusters. I can't remember actually writing any code to tell the nodes to communicate to each other, ed editing any XML file to do that. It just kind of works. Um, it's got a really cool tag-based tag distributed file system. Um, so you're not dealing with directory structures and so on, but what you're dealing with are uh, tags. Uh, so you can tag the same blob of data different ways. It, it has some really nice properties that I'll talk about in a second as well. And you know, really important for us, minimal DevOps effort. You know, uh, again, a small startup. You don't want to have three people just maintaining your cluster all the time. Uh, both the Erlang code and the Python code that ship with Disco are s small, efficient, and readable. Um, makes, it, makes, makes it really great for debugging and uh, finding out what's going on. And when you're running your jobs, it's got a really um, almost non-existent footprint. Um, so what's Inferno? We were using Disco uh, from the very beginning of our uh, company's uh, sort of adventure into big data. And we uh, started developing certain patterns of usage. And, uh, more and more, these patterns start evolving into a little mini framework that, you know, earlier this year we decided should become an open source project that everybody else can take advantage of. Uh, we like to see Disco really grow and really take its sort of rightful place as one of the uh, best MapReduce platforms out there. And uh, we thought that by contributing our little bit of it to the community, it might, uh, it might at least help in that regard. Um, Inferno is all in Python. Uh, so sorry. <laughs> um, Chango, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Chango. We're, uh, we're an ad tech company. Uh, we created a technology called search retargeting, which basically works like AdWords, but in the uh, display advertising world, the so-called banner ad world, uh, which basically allows, allows us to target users that have searched for something uh, in the past. So if you searched for, uh, say, you know, iPhone and, you know, Apple is one of our advertisers, which they're not. Um, we would be, then be able to match you on the real-time ad exchanges and, uh, and serve you an ad that, that, that was relevant to your search. Uh, the technology that, that basically makes it all happen is called real-time bidding. Uh, it allows uh, many different ad networks have now put up their ad inventory um, up for real-time bidding. Uh, essentially, guys like Google, AppNexus, AdMelt, so on and so on. Um, put their ad inventory up for, uh, up for an auction, and we have to be participating in that auction. The auctions are super, super fast paced. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of requests per second. And every one of those requests results in essentially a line or log files that, about something about that ad. Now, if we happen to bid on that ad, we would log that again. If we happen to serve an ad, we would log that again. If a user clicks on an ad, so on and so forth. So every action, starting with the very uh, first request for, for a bid on that ad, is logged and processed by our system. That amounts to about 10 billion records a day today, although that number really goes up and down. And uh, with some of the new products we're about to build, that number might even double. 
Um, briefly, also, uh, you know, uh, even though the code base for Inferno is in, uh, is in Python, uh, we have a couple of major Erlang projects that sort of power the Django uh, uh, infrastructure. One of them is Couchbase, which I believe, again, they're uh, uh, at this conference and talking about their product, a really cool product. They're, our real-time bidding platform uses Couchbase. We're, uh, you know, roughly around 200,000 requests per second are, are sort of pumped through Couchbase. Uh, very, very, very cool project. And Disco, of course, we have currently uh, about 24 nodes, uh, about two terabytes in each node. N not a massive cluster, but amazingly, it gets a lot done. Um, so what does Inferno do? Inferno is really a uh, sort of a DSL for querying your log files. As I said, uh, our system is really uh, performance sensitive, so we never log to a persistent data store other than basically log files. And uh, what, what Inferno allows us to do is uh, write rules that uh, go through these log files really fast and sort of give us summary data about it. Uh, it also allows us to do uh, automation around th this reporting. So uh, we have about 40 different sort of database tables that contain summary data of all the data we have. And these 40 tables are populated on a regular basis by jobs that run automatically uh, on Inferno, uh, on Disco using Inferno. Um, you know, one of, one of the benefits is for us that instead of, uh, you know, buying a massive uh, data store uh, uh, and paying, you know, a massive licensing fees, we, we were able to summarize billions of records into thousands of rows and insert it into uh, our uh, data warehouse. Um, interestingly, because of the interesting properties of Disco and the way it sort of uh, uh, launches jobs on, on distributed nodes, we've actually been using it as kind of a distributed computing platform doing uh, some, of the, some of the stuff we, we do requires a lot of parallel computing and uh, without actually doing any real MapReduce. Uh, and we've basically been uh, doing that as well. Uh, uh, now, the thing we do with logs is, uh, is a little bit different maybe than, uh, than your average logging, but, uh, but you know, Inferno works with both your standard sort of CSV type logging. We actually happen to log everything in a structured format. So each line of our log is just like a val valid JSON. Um, packet. That has some nice properties uh, as uh, you'll see in Tim's demo in a few minutes. But if, even if you sort of log just tab separated or comma separated lines of just data, you could uh, definitely use Inferno's uh, tools. Also, uh, we would like to replay our logs <coughs> often. Uh, that's either to reprocess data or to try to simulate events and see if a new algorithm improves on the existing uh, uh, on the existing one. Uh, and the way we accomplish that is all of our li lines of, uh, have, a, have a timestamp on them, and each, each time we push our logs to uh, DDFS, we tag them with a date as well. And that has a very nice property that you're, you're gonna see in a second. Now, Disco has this uh, really cool uh, concept of chunking you know, our, our large sort of source data files. It basically splits them up into smaller parts, compresses them, and puts them on uh, various nodes on the cluster. By putting them on uh, different nodes in the cluster, it allows uh, the jobs that are running to operate on them in parallel. So here's an example of uh, a line of our logs expanded out, and that's literally <laughs> one of the lines uh, Somebody's searching for five signs of stroke, but uh, uh, <laughs> let me show you a uh, uh, let me show you a sort of a quick demo of what what our sort of cluster looks like and what I all right. So if I can make this happen, so this is sort of your standard disco screen uh, um, that this is actually our live production cluster. So yellow means stuff is running. So. Uh, you know, these things will start becoming very clear after uh, Tim shows you the demo, but these are the Inferno jobs that are currently active in the, on the Disco cluster. Uh, the green means they just finished uh, successfully, yellow means they're in progress, and red means they're failed for some reason. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the 24 nodes are basically kind of, or 23 nodes, a, what happened to 24th node? I don't know. Um, or kind of going at it right now. All right. So uh, back to my, back here. All right, so what does the, what does the query DSL look like? The query DSL has three major components. The topmost uh, 
level is a rule. A rule basically describes what you want to do with your data. The rule has key sets, and the key sets have parts, and I'll, I'll get to them in a minute. Uh, there are two types of rules that you can specify in Inferno. There's, uh, they're, they're, kind of, they're automatic rules, basically what I, what I talked about before, things that you can basically run on a, on a schedule. They go through the logs and basically do something with the data, and they do it on a regular basis. You can also run the same rules or different rules manually from the command line to just make your life a lot easier. Uh, you can specify the data source, where the data is coming from. Uh, DDFS is normally where the data comes from, but for, for a rule, we've extended it to support S3, for instance, so you could actually pull your logs from S3 or uh, HTTP or whatever. Um, and the rules also, optionally, can, uh, can specify a date range. So you could basically say, I want to operate on files from you know, uh, three days ago until today or something, and, and go from there. Rules also allow you to specify processors. These are pre and post processors, allow you to uh, sort of massage your data before you get them into the, uh, uh, into the MapReduce job. And I promise you all this is gonna become a lot more clear once Tim gets, uh, get, does his demo. Um, I'm actually gonna run through this a lot uh, quickly just so we have time for the, uh, for the more interesting part of the, the talk. And transformations uh, also, so it allows you to transform your data. You know, if, if your data comes in as a CSV, everything is string. Sometimes you want to operate on integers or floats or whatever, and it allows you to do that. Uh, so key sets are uh, basically uh, allow you to specify the sort of the map and the reduce part. Uh, there's at least one key set per rule, but you can have multiple. Uh, the reason you would have multiple key sets is so you could operate on the same log files and extract different sets of information from them. Instead of going over the same file, over and over again, in the same run, you will look at the file from different angles and extract different pieces of information from it. Um, so yeah, the parts would basically be the key parts, which sort of the map phase, and then the, the uh, value parts, which are the, sort of the reduce. So as an example, if I wanted to count all the clicks on an ad on a particular site, the keys would be the ad ID and the site ID, and the values would be uh, you know, the, the count magic function. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that in the, in the demo. Uh, so here's an example of an Inferno rule. Uh, this is actually a more complicated example than it needs to be. Some of these things are automatic now. Uh, but uh, again, the be best, uh, best seen in a, in a demo. Um, some of the things that you can do at the key set level as well as field transforms, as I said. You could basically can transform one field from one type to the other. You can, in fact, create new fields as you go uh, uh, based on sort of existence or non-existence of other fields. Uh, so if you're looking at a JSON log, for instance, and you've upgraded the version of the log file. In the previous version, there was a field missing. If that field exists in a new version, you'll act on it. Otherwise, you, you can basically create, uh, ignore, or create basically that, that new field from scratch or use some previous data to calculate it. Uh, you can do selects, as in filter out things that you don't want to operate on as well. And you can chain these selects, these filters together. It, it's sort of modeled right after the, the way Disco does its own uh, uh, input streams and so on. So you can chain a whole bunch of uh, selectors and generators together to, to do some really cool things. Uh, you can do post-processing. One of the things that we do a lot at Chango is we use the post-processing function to, to take the summary data that's generated by, by the MapReduce and actually insert it to a database. Uh, it, it's sort of a unique way of dealing with it, I think. Uh, but uh, you can basically do anything you want in the post-processor function. You're dealing with the, the, the results of the, your MapReduce job. You can have it sorted or not sorted if, and sort of go from there. And uh, you know, if we've predefined some input streams to help to help to help out, especially with the JSON stuff, which is uh, our uh, standard uh, logging mechanism. Uh, archiving is a, a really a, one of the things that we think uh, is the best uh, feature in Inferno. Um, let me give you an example. As I said, we uh, we have logs that are basically. So let's take our ad server. It's constantly logging, right? It's never nonstop. Every 15 minutes, we take the ad server logs from all the different servers and we push them to one single DDFS tag on Disco. You know, 15 minutes later, you're pushing again to the same tag. So we keep on pushing these blobs to the same tag, and the archiving mechanism allows us to only operate on tags that haven't already been operated on. So if you have a constant sort of stream of data coming in, uh, the best uh, so the archiving allows you to basically look at the blobs that are not that haven't been processed and process them. So to avoid duplication, um, archiving also basically uses the tags that are the uh, dates that are embedded, embedded in the tags to uh, write back to the correct uh, process tag, as well as if you want to do any um, reprocessing your data, it also allows you to do that. And in general, uh, uh, 
you know, it, it's the mechanism that allows us to do sort of scheduled jobs. All right, at this point, I think it's time to see this in action as opposed to the abstract stuff that I've been talking about. So I'll let Tim take over and go from there. Okay. Um, Thanks, Matt. You want to take my... Uh, Hey folks, uh, I think what I might try and do is sit this way so I can keep one eye on the screen and one eye on y'all. <coughs> yeah, I promise I won't get into debugging, which uh, when we did yeah, the run yesterday, <laughs> what happened. All right. So what I wanted to do is uh, give you a, uh, a feel for how we use Inferno with Disco. Um, and so instead of using our log files, I just went out and grabbed some US Census data, which is fascinating. Um, and uh, so we're gonna, take, we're gonna take a look at it uh, uh, with that. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this guy over here. Ah, uh, font size. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just take a look at the data and we'll see if we need font size because I don't know if I can have a lot of room here. Um, so here's a sample of the CSV file. This, this is uh, employment data uh, for the US, US Census. Um, so it, it gives you a breakdown by state and by industry, by sector. And, um, and so what we're going to do is we're just going to write a couple of rules and hopefully you guys will get a, a feel for what you can do with Inferno. Um, a couple of features of this, uh, you've got, you know, it's a CSV file. We're talking about JSON. Um, we can do JSON, CSV, we have, uh, you know, all of the input uh, streams to deal with that. Um, the data will give, there's a code, there's a bunch of codes here for enterprise size, and then there's descriptions over here of them. So there's like uh, code two means zero through four and so on. I think I have this uh, up here. So there's some codes that tell us how big enterprises are. And so what we can do is split this out by, you know, we can ask questions about uh, what states have what size enterprises and how many employees and what's their payroll and that kind of stuff. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, dig right in and start out with a, um, an empty file. The way that we've uh, done this, just to make it um, you know, easy, we could do a lot of introspection and stuff on, on the code to figure out where your rules are, but we've just decided on a convention you have a variable named rules, which is a list of rules, and then you point Inferno at that file and say execute this rule, and we'll see how that goes. So um, what you do is you create an Inferno rule, and you give it a name, uh, and so on. So you, you just fill in a few things. One of the uh, one of the things my autocorrect here. Uh, one of the things that you tell it is uh, what where you want the data to come from. So this would be what tags in DDFS do we want to pull out, uh, and that's a list. So you could specify multiple. And at this point, I'll give you a little. Um, We'll go and take a look at the tags that we've got in DDFS, and I'll give you a quick, uh, I guess this will be fine. Uh, by convention, you have in DDFS, and I, probably the, the guys in the, that are going to be talking about Disco, I don't want to steal the thunder or anything, but just the naming convention is usually uh, colon separated, and so we're going to, here's the, the sample that I uploaded into my cluster. 
um, and so and so on. I've actually got a uh, I've got all of this stuff written over here, and what I'm going to do is copy and paste it. Um, the one rule that uh, that we're going to look at first, and I'll just copy it over so that it's a little bit, we can move along a little bit quicker. Okay, so we're going to look for the largest employing states in the U.S. Here's our source tags, is uh, that, you know, tag in DDFS. We have this thing called a parts preprocess. And what this takes is a list of functions. And this is a pipeline, if, if you will, of, of functions that the data will run through in the map phase. It allows you to do three things. It allows you to add more data uh, to your parts, that is your inbound data, each line. It allows you to select data, and it allows you to generate data. And you can, uh, as you specify a pipeline of them, the data will run through it, and you can do really useful things. Uh, so my ID here is telling me I have to supply a function called uh, filter totals. And so let's jump back here and grab that function, and we'll talk about it. Typically what you're doing in uh, preprocessors is, uh, is you know, dealing with the actual data. So you're looking at your uh, data definitions and you're saying, you know, if the, the parts contains the actual one line of data coming in from the file, uh, it's organized it into a nice dictionary for you to access. Uh, that dictionary is built using this, which I took from the CSV file here, saying these are the expected fields in the in the CSV. Um, so what I can do is I can say parts past NAX is not equal to this. NAX is this code, this industry code, um, and my, where my enterprise size is not equal to one. Uh, in the sample, we can see that uh, there's an enterprise size. The one is, is the totals. Now, the interesting thing about the demo, so you get the feeling that, okay, so we're going to select. This is, a, this is a filter or a selector. What we're saying here is we're yielding the parts if it meets this condition. By yielding, it allows it to go on to the next uh, function in the chain, and you can chain all this stuff together. And uh, you could also uh, choose to yield multiple things for each line. Uh, and what that would allow you to do is, say, take the case where you're you know, splitting text off into constituent words or subphrases uh, and generating more data. So it's a pretty flexible mechanism and, and very simple. Uh, field transforms are very similar to parts processors. Uh, but what they do is they just call a single function with the value uh, for that particular column, if you will. So because we're dealing with a CSV file, there's no, unlike JSON, where you'd have type information. This, you don't have any type information. We've got to turn it into an int because we're going to sum this thing up. So I'll just go and, and grab that function as well. Here's another typical thing you'll be doing in Inferno or in any MapReduce thing. You, you know, if you have bad data, you don't want it to kill your whole job or whatever. So we're just going to, by convention, we'll have inaccurate data rather than a, a dead job. <clears throat> uh, this CSV fields, I kind of uh, explained this already. This is, how do I interpret? If you leave this out, what it'll do is it'll number your columns of your data and your CSV. If you've got a JSON file, it's self-tagging, so you get to use those right away. Down in the bottom here, we have the key parts and value parts. Uh, these are going to be in the map, the key parts. You know, that's our key. So give me uh, the sum of all employees for each state. OK, so we've got a rule written. 
and uh, we can go and run it. After you've installed Inferno on your system, you just run it by saying uh, Inferno. The cool thing about this is that if you've got multiple clusters, you can specify which disco master you want this stuff to run on right from the command line. So uh, my machine's called Timgo, but if you wanted to do development and run it on the production cluster, you just have to change this to uh, point to the uh, production cluster. Uh, minus I is interactive mode. This is the name of our rule. So uh, the conventions are uh, dots to separate. So demo was the name of the Python file. The rule within the Python file was largest employing states. Um, the other thing we have to tell Inferno is where to look for um, uh, where to look for this uh, code, uh, this rule, uh, and for reasons that we can't reveal, it's the minus y option. Um, uh, and uh, I think that should do it. So this says, run that rule that's in that demo file on Timgo, my cluster, uh, and find the files in this directory. We'll let that chew away for a little while. You can see here, um, you've got some basic logging. Starting the job gives you your disco job ID, uh, and it tells you how many blobs it's, it's chewing away on. Uh, this is about a million lines of data, the employment data for the census. Uh, and it's from, I believe, 2009. Um, so we can go see it running in Disco. Um, that's a production Disco. This is Timgo. Um, you can see I ran a whole bunch of stuff before and killed them. Um, so if you, you know, dial in on it, you'll see MapReduce is already done. Uh, it's it's uh, busy reducing here. Uh, I've only got, uh, you know, I've, I've assigned five processing units. Obviously, if you had a cluster of machines, it would be running it across, you know, all of them. Um, uh, we might even be able to finish this before going on to the next rule. Okay, so here's our output. Um, you know, Type it into a file, put it in Excel, make a pie chart, I don't know. Um, that's the basic idea. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do uh, now is just take a look at uh, slightly more, where's my mouse? Uh, slightly more, you know, just elaborate on this, on this rule a little bit. Um, so I'll go over here. We've got, um, Right, so wrote another one here, and let's paste that one in here. Here, I'll comment this guy out. <coughs> Indent it like uh, Python like. So what I'm going to do here, and, and this is for interactive type what if analysis, what you'll typically be doing is you'll, you'll be doing a general type of query uh, across uh, you know, a constrained set of keys with a lot of summary data. And then what we can do with Inferno is pass in parameters uh, on the command line that get plugged into the preprocessor functions. So you can say, um, here we're going to be looking at these uh, um, NAICS codes or, and NAICS descriptions. These are the, the sectors, um, so manufacturing or fishing or whatever. Um, and then you'll also be able to slice and dice based on the size of the, of the corporation. So this is going to be looking at the prof professions and sizes, uh, and you'll be getting all of the summable data. Um, one of the things that I kind of failed to mention is that for 
uh, our values, the default operation on all value parts is just to sum them. Um, this might be a little, you know, naive, but we were finding that that was nine, that covers off 90% of the cases that we were doing. And I suspect that's the same in most MapReduce kind of uh, applications. Of course, everything is over, overridable here. If you don't like the, 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 the map or reduce functions in, in Inferno, you can specify your own map and reduce functions right here as well. So, Okay, so let's take a look at this. I've added another uh, uh, two functions here. And what we typically find, uh, you'll have keys and you'll have parts preprocessors that select for those keys. Let me just go and copy the functions. We'll take a closer look at them. And um, so this is select the enterprise size and select the, the industry or sector. Whoops, did that copy? So put those guys up here and just take a closer look. Okay, so basically you've got the same thing we saw in the last function. It's a type of conditional yielding, so it's a filter. Um, but it has an additional test here on this params. So params are uh, parameters that are passed in data that you can use, usually metadata about your rule or whatever. Um, they get passed to all the jobs that are running both in all phases. So the maps and the reduces all get these params. We have a way on the command line of adding your own params. So in this case, I'm actually creating a thing called size in. If it's present, then do this test. If it's not present, just yield. It's basically an optional uh, parameter. So this allows me to say, I only want to look at companies that are less than 500 or companies that are uh, less than 20 and greater than uh, 500 and so on. Same NAX is the same thing. I'm interested, except in this case what we're saying because the NAX code is a hierarchical code. It's like a six-digit code, but it's prefix, like 3-3, three, three, for example, is manufacturing. And then all the 3-3 three, three stars will be like all these different, uh, will be all the different types of manufacturing. So what I can do is I can, I can say at any level, give me you know, all manufacturing or a, part, you know, a very particular sector. So with just these two uh, uh, you know, standard-looking functions, and this rule, I've built a fairly robust and uh, useful uh, rule that I can launch from the command line. The only question is, how do I get the data in? So if I want to specify the enterprise size and so on, and I'll show you that uh, in the um, command line. So let's clear this data. I'll start from my last rule. And uh, so, uh, the parameters will pretty much be the same. Obviously, the rule name is different. It's summary by profession. Um, still going to do it here. To pass in custom data, uh, I use the capital P. And I say, um, what were the name of those things? Oops. Honor size in. And remember, this honor size is this special code. So let's, let's take a look at um, uh, enterprises that are less than 20 employees. So I would do that by specifying honor size in uh, 05. And if you wanted to do other ones, if you wanted to do less than this and greater than 500, you could go on. But let's just look at this one. And I also wanted to look at uh, NAICS equals. So I'm saying minus P. Uh, NAICS equals, 
let's say 33. I know that's manufacturing. Well, it didn't die, so that's a good sign. Uh, again, we can see our summary by uh, profession grinding away. Let's go look at our code again for a sec. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot more to Inferno than these simple ones. Uh, you can specify the the way it handles dates. So in the way we run stuff in production, everything has a date tag, and a lot of the operations in Inferno will you'll be able to specify you know where the date tag is or the date is tagged inside the tags, and you'll be able to specify ranges and so on. So you can and the way it typically works is because we always work backwards. We say let's start with yesterday's click logs and work back 30 days or last week's and work back 10 days from there. So from the command line, you can very quickly, if you've got canned rules, and typically what we're doing is we're building like libraries of these rules and then doing analysis as uh, you know, business requires, um, either on the command line or in an automated way and send out reports and so on. So. Um, as you can see, here's all the, uh, here's our results, came back, and even on a single machine, I mean, you can see it's pretty snappy to go through, uh, you know, a million odd records. Uh, obviously, it's like that on real production hardware in a real cluster. Um, so, you know, this is the forging and stamping and so on. Um, there's some, there's some funky uh, professions in here, too, which are kind of interesting. Uh, let's see, if we look at the next codes. Um, hunting and trapping. There's, uh, there's fishing, but there's, uh, there's also fin fish fishing. Didn't even, wasn't even aware of what that is. I mean, you can go in and dig in on this stuff and, uh, and uh, you know, take a look at it. Um, I mean, I could go on with more rules, but I mean, I think that that kind of gives you a flavor for what Inferno is and what you can do with it. Um, sure. Uh, just hit play, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Disco Inferno with Steve, uh, Jimmy Ellis, the guy who wrote it, just uh, yeah, died last week. So this presentation is dedicated to, to Jimmy. Um, I guess we'll, yeah, that's our, that's our info. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, where do we run it? Um, we have dedicated cluster uh, at a data center, um, but you know you could run it in the cloud. Um, yeah, we use dedicated hardware. Um, it's just we find it's a lot more reliable and so on for us and um, we don't have, you know, our requirements don't change, they just kind of keep getting bigger. <laughs> so uh, that's how we do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, the question is, uh, could we do what we're doing with Disco in, uh, in the database? Um, the reality is we've got so much data and at different intervals that we find that it can be, you know, the summaries that we can get uh, using Disco can shrimp, shrink our data size by like, you know, magnitudes, orders of magnitude. 
So we find it you know, really useful to do disco up front for that, for data that is bound for the database anyway. It makes everything faster, makes everything uh, run better, and it doesn't, it doesn't cost us a lot to do that compression up front. Now, uh, the, uh, the other thing is, is operating on really big sets of raw data. We're producing raw data anyway because we've got all of these uh, processes that are generating the log files and being able to do operations directly on them uh, that might be quite expensive, machine learning algorithms and so on, um, that we don't have to burden our production database uh, where people are expecting that to be responsive for dashboards and UIs. Um, so that's kind of, we, we find a role for both uh, both things, but the lines are blurring. Um, Can I just borrow your mic for a second? Certainly. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, certainly for some of our logs, the database works just fine. Uh, in fact, to, you know, have a, a, a commercial data warehouse in production as well, where. Uh, now, now that our summary data has grown so big that even for the summary data, we needed a really robust uh, database. Uh, so we can put, say, our impression logs in there, like the, the ad server logs, but our real-time bidding logs, where we're talking about over 10 billion just real-time bidding logs, uh, there's just no way we're gonna be able to fit them in a database uh, without paying just massive, massive amount. And it won't be able to uh, really do things like data transformations, Real, you know, real-time operations like machine learning algorithms that we uh, run <coughs> uh, on Disco. And one of the things I mentioned earlier was that we do distributed computing, quote unquote, with the Disco cluster, and w one of those operations is machine learning. So we go through these logs and mostly operate in the map phase, really. We just, in the map phase, which is distributed across the cluster, we do certain things to the logs, and, and sometimes there's even there's not even a reduce phase. So uh, all the real uh, sort of computation happens in that phase, and it's, uh, but it's in parallel, it's across uh, all the nodes and so on. Uh, sure, this question. How about Hadoop? Uh, why not use Hadoop? Right, why not Hadoop is the question. Uh, you know, again, I think I answered the question early on in the talk. Uh, Hadoop takes manpower to set up and operate. It really, it's not that I've, we have, you know, we, we didn't try, but as a startup, we wanted something that just works and it just is really fast. And, uh, you know, Disco gave us that. You know, it, it, again, the fact that the Erlang sort of subsystem automatically takes care of all the networking and the clustering, the fact that the jobs are super lightweight and they were in Python, which happened to be the language we were using for our front end anyway, or back end anyway, which was really great. But, uh, you know, should you have a bunch of Java jar files sitting around and want to run them on Disco, you can still use the, the new version of Disco supports workers that you can basically run it in any language. You, you can run the jobs in Erlang if you wanted to, for, um, and, uh, or OCaml or, uh, you know, any other sort of uh, uh, language you desire. Um, the other, the big, so the DevOps effort was the number one reason. Number two reason was just we, we didn't like dealing with XML files and so on, and then uh, Disco just made sense uh, because it was so lightweight, took one day to set up, honestly. Uh, and now that we know how to set it up, it takes about 25 minutes to set up. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Constantly? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the question is, do you, do, are the rules or just, you know, do you have to run the rules manually all the time or does the system automatically take care of running the rules? Uh, if I understand correct, correct? No, I'm talking about in Python because uh, these are runtime compiled? No, it's runtime. So it's, okay, so the question was, is the runtime is it compiled, quote unquote compiled? No, it's not compiled. It, it's basically just good old fashioned Python. It, it uses a Python interpreter. And now Python does create these Py, Py C files, which is really just uh, uh, bytecode. Uh, but there's nothing inherently, com you know, uh, compiled about it. Uh, it, it. 
starts an interpreter for every single job. Every, jo every job has got a new interpreter, and the interpreter basically starts asking. The jobs are so lightweight. I mean, honestly, the, if you look at the big, you know, the whole disco code base and add on top of it the Inferno sort of uh, bits, you're talking about, you know, a few hundred lines of Python that are actually mostly I.O. So um, if you really wanted to speed certain portions of it up, you could use uh, C modules uh, to do that. And the only caveat is that you have to get your C modules loaded in, all, in your cluster everywhere. So when the, when the Python interpreter uh, loads, it has the C modules to go with it. Um, but our, uh, our system basically just runs Python. It gets, when you run it on the, when you start the job, it basically pickles, uh, uses the Python, Python marshalling system called pickle, the entire sort of environment, and then ships the pickled code across to the entire disco cluster and starts running it. Um, it's kind of a funny, th funny thing, but it's really, it works really well. <laughs> Yes. Uh, the interface for you know what that's a better question for the, some some of the uh, the disco folks. But what what I uh, Jared's right here. Wanna, Jared, you want to try to take this question? It's using ports. You said. Okay. Just for the record, so it goes into the video. It's using ports. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the question is, the, does sampling your data sometimes work better than just running through the entire thing? Well, not better, it's just that you can find it as representative. Oh, as representative. Okay. Well, that's actually a pretty domain-specific thing. If, if the data that we have, uh, when we're doing our machine learning uh, type work, uh, we look at you know clicks and conversions as our sort of signals for uh, what we want to optimize for. And uh, frankly, those things are much more sporadic than the massive pipe of incoming bid requests. So uh, if we don't run through our entire uh, data set, we're actually going to not be uh, doing ourselves any favors because we're probably going to miss a lot of signals. But if you, if you happen to have a lot of signals in your code, then you can use a small portion of it and just sort of do your tests with it. Now, one of the things that I personally discovered recently was that uh, uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of neat Python packages that are sort of designed around doing mach machine learning uh, that I, uh, didn't know existed, and so one of the things we go, we're just experimenting with is instead of because we rolled our own code to, to do machine learning, is to, to use these packages, which are basically in C and a lot faster, to see if we can uh, basically run those on the disco cluster and see what they come back with. But our particular data set it doesn't really respond well to sampling. Well, the one natural sample I suppose that we use would be date ranges. Um, I mean, instead of doing it on all the data, we will we'll ask the rule to perform it. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Some, so the date ranges, uh, as Tim was saying, if you, know, you guys didn't hear that, um, it w are, are sort of a natural sample that, that we use sometimes. It turns out, uh, if you're going to use any bid data in our case, uh, going more than five days results in so much data that it just, you're just going to basically <laughs> sort of destroy the cluster. You're just going to be sitting there for hours. And so if you take only like three or four days of bid data and combine with maybe uh, a few uh, days or weeks of uh, conversion data, that actually ends up giving you a some pretty nice results. Uh, any other sort of questions, comments? No. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you very much.